very good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to this week 8 NPTEL Rights Peer Session for the course Cell Culture Technology. Uh, my name is Ankita Day and I am one of the TAs for this course and I host this uh, session every week on Tuesdays. So as uh, you already know that uh, this is a live interactive one our video session where we discuss some uh, previous year's assignment questions that uh, helps us in solving this year's assignment questions and towards the end of our segment we have a Q&A session where you can ask me your queries by posting them in the chat box and I try to answer them and at the end of each session we also provide you with the uh, PowerPoint slides and the link to the recorded video session for your access later. So uh, moving on. So before we discuss the assignment questions, we will quickly recapitulate a few key points that will help us in solving the questions. So in this week's uh, video lectures, we had seen, we had discussed about the nerve impulse transmission process uh, across the synapse or along the axon of a neuron uh, and we had mainly focused on the micro cantilever system which is uh, used to study the process of force generation or to quantify the force generation in muscles in an in vitro cell culture system. Further we had also discussed about the neuron muscle co-culture system. So uh, we will discuss uh, each of these in our upcoming slides. Now, uh, first of all, uh, we will discuss about the nerve impulse transmission process across the synapse and along the axon. So, in our previous video lecture, uh, we had discussed or learned about the structure of a neuron. So, as you are already aware, uh, the neuron looks somewhat like this. It has a cell body or the soma, which contains the nucleus and other intracellular organelles. Apart from that, it also bears these outward projections which are known as the dendrites and these dendrites are responsible for receiving a signal or input from other neurons and after that the uh, cell body the soma gives rise to the axon which in, uh, which uh, forms from a region, region known as the axon hilla. So uh, if the received input or the signal is strong enough the it will pass the signal will pass along the length of the axon uh, to the downstream new neurons. So the transmission of the signal uh, within a neuron occurs in one direction only that is uh, it is received by the dendrites and uh, from the cell body of the soma it is carried uh, along the axon to the end of the axon terminal and this is mainly carried out by the opening and closing of voltage gated ion channels which cause a, a reversal of the resting membrane potential to create an action potential. And as the action potential travels along the axon, the polarity changes across the membrane. Once the signal reaches the axon terminal, it stimulates other neurons. So uh, here we have come across several terminologies such as uh, the axon potential, uh, the action potential which we will discuss in our next slide. So an uh, action potential is formed by the following steps. So if a stimulus is received by the sensory cell or the neuron, it causes the target cell to depolarize towards the threshold potential. And if the threshold excitation uh, is reached, all the sodium channels open and the membrane depolarizes. Uh, at the peak action potential, potassium channels open and it begins to leave the cell and at the same time sodium channels close. Uh, the membrane becomes hyperpolarized as potassium ions continue to leave the cell. Uh, the hyperpolarized membrane is in a refractory period and cannot fire. The potassium channels close and the sodium potassium transporter restores the resting potential. So uh, this is the basic uh, mechanism of the formation of an action potential. So here in the joining figure you can see. So in the resting condition the uh, membrane potential is at minus 70 millivolt. However, if a stimulus is received uh, by the neuron, it depolarizes uh, the neuron such that its uh, voltage or the its resting membrane potential changes. 
that is it becomes from a negative value to positive value so the membrane cannot be depolarized until it has reached a threshold value and uh, for this neuron that is the one that is sh shown here for this neuron the threshold excitation uh, voltage is shown as minus 55 millivolt so unless the cell is receiving a stimulus which is uh, strong enough to change its potential to uh, less than minus 55 millivolt it won't be depolarized so once the neuron has a uh, reached this excitation value that is uh, it has uh, depolarized to below minus 55 millivolt it will uh, the action potential will start and the resting membrane potential it will the resting membrane potential will be reversed that is the normal resting condition the inside of the neuron is considered to be is uh, inside of the neuron is uh, considered to contain less number of sodium ions so this will lead to the opening of voltage gated sodium ion channel and the inflow of the sodium ion channel uh, sodium ions into the neuron as sodium ions enter inside the neuron the membrane potential changes and it becomes more positive and it can go up to about plus 30 millivolt so uh, as this action potential peak action potential is reached this will lead to the opening of the potassium ion channels now one thing we must see here is that the sodium ion channels open faster than the potassium ion channels so by the time the potassium ion channels open the sodium ion channels will begin to close and as the potassium ion channels open it will lead to the outflow of the potassium ions from inside the neuron to the outside and then the, act, uh, the voltage of the neuron will uh, start to drop here and it will start to reach attain its resting membrane potential again so as i already told you that the sodium ion channels open and close faster than the potassium ion channels so the potassium channels by the time the potassium ion channels close the membrane has uh, has hyperpolarized so this has reached a, a potential that is lower than minus 70 millivolt which could be about say minus 90 millivolt so to again attain this resting membrane potential we have these channels which are known as the sodium uh, potassium transporter they will they are mainly responsible for restoring the resting potential so uh, this is the uh, pathway by which this action potential is formed now the nerve impulse transmission across the axon can be of two types it could be either uh, saltatory uh, as for uh, the which is caused for the myelinated axon or it could be continuous so for the continuous conduction what happens is uh, the axon is non myelinated and it will lead to the opening and closing of the sodium ion channels uh, all across the axon however for the uh, myelinated axon uh, the nerve impulse transmission is saltatory that is it will the sodium ion channels are present only at the region where the myelin sheath is absent that is the nodes of Ranvier and this will lead to a much faster nerve impulse transmission across the axon and the opening and closing of the sodium ion channels will happen only at the at the nodes of the Ranvier so this is a so the speed or the nerve impulse transmission will depend on mainly two factors one is the diameter of the axon and the next is the presence or the absence of the myelin sheet next moving on uh, so we uh, have come across two important terms here that is the depolarization and hyperpolarization of the action potential so uh, what does depolarization mean so when the neurotransmitter molecules bind to receptors located on a neuron's dendrites voltage gated ion channels open at the excitatory synapses positive ions enter the neuron and depolarize the membrane decreasing the difference in voltage between the inside and the outside of the neuron a stimulus from a sensory cell or another neuron depolarizes the target neuron to its threshold potential and sodium channels in the axon hillock open starting an action potential uh, once the sodium channels open the neuron completely depolarizes to a membrane potential of about 40 millivolt and the action push uh, action action potential travels down the neuron as the sodium channels open 
Next, we were discussing about the hyperpolarization and the return to the resting potential. So, action potentials are considered an all or nothing event. Once the threshold potential is reached, the neuron completely depolarizes. As the depolarization is complete, the cell resets its membrane voltage back to the resting potential. The sodium channels close beginning the neuron's refractory period. So the refractory period refers to the period during which the neuron is not excitable to another stimulus. And at the same time, the voltage-gated potassium channels open, allowing the potassium to leave the cell. Uh, as potassium ions leave the cell, the membrane potential once again becomes negative. Uh, however, the diffusion of potassium ions out of the cell hyperpolarizes the cell. As I told you that the potassium ion channels close more slowly, which leads to hyperpolarization of the neuron, making the membrane potential more negative than the cell's normal resting potential. Uh, at this point, the sodium channels return to the resting state, uh, ready to open again if the membrane potential again exceeds the threshold potential. So at this point, um, the neuron is excitable to another incoming stimulus. Uh, eventually, the extra, extra potassium ions diffuse out of the cell through the potassium leakage channels, uh, bringing the cell from its hyperpolarized state back to its resting membrane potential. So this last step is carried out by the sodium-potassium ATPS pumps. Next, uh, the neuromuscular junction. So, so far we have discussed about the nerve impulse transmission uh, across the axon. That is, uh, the process of nerve impulse transmission across the length of the axon and how it takes place. So, you have seen that the nerve impulse transmission takes place by the opening and closing of the uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channels and the potassium ion channels. However, at the neuromuscular junction, that is at the end of the axon terminal where uh, one neuron uh, connects to a postsynaptic neuron or a muscle. There, uh, at the neuromuscular junction, if it, the neuron connects to a muscle, so in that case, we call it a motor neuron. So if uh, a neuron is uh, is uh, sending a stimulus to a muscle, uh, at that region, that is at the neuromuscular junction, or it could also be a neuron-neuron junction. So at that place, that is at the end of the axon terminal, nerve impulse transmission takes place with the help of the uh, neurotransmitter molecules and it is caused by the opening of voltage gated calcium ion channel. So this is the main difference that uh, along the axon it was carried out by the sodium and potassium ions whereas at the axon terminal it is carried out by the calcium channel. So when the stimulus is received by the end of the axon terminal this, uh, this swollen region. So this causes the opening of the calcium ion channels which will lead to the inflow of uh, calcium inside the axon terminal and will stimulate these synaptic vesicles which contain the neurotransmitter molecule. Uh, so these synaptic vessels containing the neurotransmitter will go and then fuse with, the, uh, with this membrane and it will release the neurotransmitter molecules into the synaptic cleft, which is a gap region between the neuron and the motor end plate. So, uh, at the motor end plate, uh, we have the uh, we have ligand gated channels which bear the receptors for these uh, neurotransmitter molecules, the acetylcholine receptors. So, the acetylcholine molecule will then go and bind with the uh, receptor on the uh, respective ligand gated ion channel and will then generate another action potential in the next muscle or the neuron. So, uh, this is the uh, process of the nerve impulse transmission across the axon and the neuromuscular junction. Next, uh, the types of neurotransmitters. So, different types of neurotransmitters are found in our body. Uh, for example, acetylcholine, dopamine, glycine, glutamate, endorphins, GABA, serotonin, histamine, etc. And they are mainly divided into two categories. They could be either excitatory or inhibitory based on the influence that they have on the postsynaptic neuron after binding with its receptors. So, if the binding of the, of the neurotransmitter causes the depolarization of the membrane and creates a negative net positive charge exceeding the threshold potential of the membrane and generates an action potential to fire the neuron, these types of neurotransmitters are called excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, they cause the neuron to become more excitable and stimulate the brain. Uh, this happens when the neurotransmitters bind with ion channels permeable to cations. So the examples are glutamate, acetylcholine, excitatory and inhibitory as we have discussed, epinephrine, norepinephrine, nitric oxide. 
However, if the binding of a neurotransmitter to the postsynaptic receptor does not generate an action potential to fire the neuron, uh, the type of neurotransmitter is known as inhibitory and this follows the production of negative membrane potential uh, below the threshold potential of the membrane. So, uh, if it is an excitatory neurotransmitter, it will, uh, it will uh, allow uh, the postsynaptic neuron to become more excitable to a stimulus and it will help the neuron to become depolarized more easily. However, if the neurotransmitter is inhibitory in nature, it will prevent the formation uh, of an action potential. It will prevent the membrane from uh, the neuron from being depolarized. So, the examples are GABA, glycine, serotonin and dopamine. So, these are the differences between the excitatory and the inhibitory neurotransmitter. The excitatory neurotransmitters stimulate the brain as the inhibitory neurotransmitters calm the brain and balance the brain stimulation. Uh, the generation of action potential, the excitatory neurotransmitter create positive membrane potential and generate an action potential whereas the inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, create negative membrane potential further from the threshold potential to generate an action potential. Uh, the examples as we have already discussed as given here. Next, uh, moving on, uh, some of the animal neurotoxins. So, uh, neurotoxins are mainly responsible for uh, preventing the preventing the formation uh, of a stimulus and will prevent the uh, nerve impulse transmission. So, uh, the nerve impulse transmission can be blocked at several stages. So, the presynaptic action where uh, the acetylcholine release is blocked and there are uh, or the acetylcholine supply is exhausted. So, these are two methods by which it can be uh, the nerve impulse transmission can be blocked uh, with the help of neurotoxins. Uh, so, in the pre at the presynaptic level, either the acetylcholine release or the, block, or the release of the neurotransmitter could be blocked or uh, the acetylcholine supply could be exhausted. The examples are beta bangarotoxin, which is obtained from the banded great snake. Uh, the next example is venom of the black widow spider. Next, at the postsynaptic level, uh, the combination with acetylcholine receptors is blocked, causing non depolarizing block. And the examples are alpha bangarotoxin, which is also obtained from branded crate, cobrotoxin obtained from cobra, crotoxin, which is obtained from rattlesnake. Uh, and the pre and post synaptic action, it is uh, it blocks the combination with sodium carrier, causing the block of action potential uh, such that no depolarization is possible. The example is tetrodotoxin obtained from the Japanese pufferfish and saxitonin, the flagellate, uh, gonia luox, catenella. Next, uh, it could be also caused by a depolarizing block, batchaka toxin. So, these are uh, examples of uh, different types of toxins which are known to block the uh, acetylcholine either release or they binding to its specific receptors and they block the uh, further transmission of the nerve impulse. So, the joining figure shows uh, how the how these different toxins block the uh, flow of the nerve impulse at different levels along with the examples. So, here the acetylcholine synthesis, uh, packaging, release, diffusion, combination with receptors, depolarization, opening of sodium channels and mus muscle action potential generation. Uh, so, these are the steps that are shown and the examples of the uh, different toxins which are capable of blocking each of these steps are shown uh, in the corresponding image. Next, moving on. Uh, so, next we had studied about the uh, process of force generation measurement in an in vitro cell culture system. Uh, for this, I have provided you with the links to uh, two papers where you can find the process of uh, how you can use the micro cantilever system to quantify the force generated by a muscle, or the myotube uh, grown on the cantilever system in an in vitro cell culture system. So, if you refer to these two papers, then uh, you can find the processes uh, very, uh, very nicely illustrated. Uh, moving on, now uh, we will discuss some of the uh, previous years assignment questions relating to the, what we have studied uh, so far. So, question number one is uh, during depolarization, the membrane potential shifts from, and we have four options here, negative to positive, positive to negative remains unchanged or none of the above. So, you can write the answers in the chat box and then we will discuss.
so as we were discussing that in resting membrane uh, the in a resting condition the membrane potential is close to uh, minus 70 millivolt and if the neuron receives a stimulus uh, so that it's uh, it receives a stimulus uh, then its membrane potential and if a threshold uh, is reached then the membrane will be depolarized and will lead to the uh, opening of sodium ion channels and the inflow of the sodium ions which will cause the uh, generation of an action potential so here uh, during depolarization the membrane potential is uh, shifting from on um, you can write the answers and then we will see what the correct option should be so uh so uh i'm getting different answers yes so let's see what the right answer should be so the right answer is negative to positive so as i was saying that in the resting condition the membrane potential is at uh, close to minus 70 millivolt however when a stimulus is reached and the threshold potential uh is reached that is uh, the cell is uh, stimulated and it reaches the threshold stim uh, threshold value threshold excitation value of uh, minus 55 millivolt then the cell will be uh, the or the neuron will be depolarized such that it will lead to the opening of sodium uh, channels or the voltage gated uh, ion channels and will lead to the influx of sodium ions so sodium is a cation and it will flow into the neuron from the outside to the inside so outside in the resting condition the ex in the extracellular fluid sodium ion channels are more abundant in the outside than in the inside and the opening of the voltage gated ion channels will cause an inflow of the sodium channels or the cations into the inside of the inside of the neuron so uh, this will lead to a reversal in the membrane polarity that it that is it will change from a negative membrane potential to a positive membrane potential so from minus 70 millivolt the membrane potential will change to uh, will can go as high up as plus 30 millivolt so during depolarization the membrane potential is becoming from more positive that is previously it was minus 70 millivolt and then next it is becoming or it is going as high up as 30 millivolt at the peak of the action potential so it is becoming negative to positive so the right option here is option a negative to positive so i hope you understood this part now let's move on to the next question so question number 2 is also related to what we have studied uh, during repolarization membrane potential shifts from negative to positive positive to negative remains unchanged or none of the above so you can write the answer and we will discuss okay so all of you are saying that it should be option b that is positive to negative so let's see what the right answer is yes uh, so the right answer is during repolarization membrane potential shifts from positive to negative so uh, we saw in the previous question that uh, during depolarization the membrane potential shifts from negative to positive so once the neuron has been depolarized that is and the action potential has been generated and it has reached the peak that is close to uh, plus 30 or say plus 40 millivolt now this voltage will uh, somewhat vary from neuron to neuron so let's take uh, that it, it it goes as high up as plus 30 or plus 40 millivolt so once the action potential has reached its peak excitation value uh, that is plus 40 millivolt it will lead to the opening of the potassium ion channels uh, so the once the potassium ion channels open it will lead to the uh, outflow of the potassium ion ions from the inside of the neuron to the outside uh, this will lead to the this will lead to uh, a decrease in the membrane potential value so it ha it had reached plus 30 millivolt now the membrane potential will start to drop and it will uh, start to reverse that is from positive to negative 
However, the potassium ion channels are close uh, slowly compared to the sodium channels such that uh, while the potassium channels are still open, the voltage that is the voltage will drop uh, lower than the resting membrane potential value. That is, it will go even below minus 70 millivolt, say uh, as low as minus 90 millivolt because the potassium channels are slower in closing compared to the sodium ion channels, which will lead to more outflow of the sodium uh, of the potassium ions to the outside. Now, at this time, uh, this this phase is known as the hyperpolarization because it is uh, polarized more than it should be. So therefore, it is referred to as hyperpolarization. And uh, at this hyperpolarized state, the potassium ion channels close and the uh, membrane is excitable to uh, another or the next stimulus. However, the resting membrane potential needs to be restored to the cell. And this is, uh, that is uh, from minus 90 millivolt, the resting membrane potential, which was minus 70 millivolt should be restored. And that is why uh, this is carried out by the sodium potassium ATPS pump. Next, uh, question number three, uh, during depolarization, which ions move inside the cell from the outside? Sodium, uh, potassium, both sodium and potassium or none of sodium and potassium. So you can write the answers. So all of you are saying that it should be option A. Uh, that is sodium. Let's see. So yes, uh, sodium is the right answer. That is during depolarization, sodium ions move inside the cell from the outside. So I had already explained this part. So we will move on to the next question. So which units of muscle uh, cannot be used for force measurement? Uh, the myotube, myofiber, myoblast or none of the above? You can write your answers. Mm, we will see. So, uh, some of you are saying there should be A, mm, some are saying there should be C. Mm, so, let's see. Uh, so, uh, the right answer is myoblast. That is, uh, the myoblast uh, cannot be used for uh, force measurement. So, let's see what uh, each of these terms uh, imply. In vivo, that is inside the body, the skeletal muscles develop through a long and complex scheme. However, in culture, investigations largely focus on a narrow window that includes the adult satellite cells, which are the quiescent cells, uh, the muscle tissue reserve cells, and their differentiation into syncytial myofibril. So, the muscles, adult muscle cells have uh, have these satellite cells, which are uh, present in a quiescent cell, and only upon trauma or injury, these satellite cells are brought into action. So, uh, the sa satellite cells are mostly quiescent in vivo and can be readily isolated and put into culture where in the presence of growth factors they proliferate and are termed the myoblasts. Uh, the latter can be made to divide extensively and induced to differentiate in a growth factor poor medium. Uh, under these conditions myoblasts permanently withdraw from the cell cycle uh, commitment stage and begin to express muscle specific genes and become mononuclear terminally differentiated myocytes. Uh, finally, the myocytes fuse with one another to generate the multinucleated myotubes. Uh, the myotubes are the smallest fun complete functional component of the skeletal muscle. Uh, so we have the uh, quiescent uh, satellite cells uh, here. So the satellite cells can be made to uh, divide or proliferate extensively uh, in a growth factor. Uh, proliferate extensively in the presence of growth factors uh, and they are termed as the myoblasts. However, when the myoblasts are made to 
uh, grow in a growth factor poor medium they will uh, withdraw from the cell cycle that is they will uh, commit themselves uh, to a specific lineage uh, at this condition uh, at this condition they are known as the myocytes and they are said to be terminally differentiated uh, the myocytes are uh, the myocytes then uh, fuse with one another to generate the multinucleated myotubes so uh, this is the myotube so you can see that the myotubes uh, are formed by the fusion of the myocytes and they bear a multinucleated uh, appearance so this is also known as a syncytium uh, so syncytium refers to the multinucleated appearance of the myotube and a myotube is the smallest complete functional component of a skeletal muscle and they are also you uh, and and therefore they are uh, myotubes are the uh, functional component of the uh, of the skeletal muscle which is used for force measurement so if you remember that uh, we use the cantilever system so on on top of the uh, cantilever system uh, we uh, we grew the myotubes and each of them were used for the measurement of the force by a for, for the skeletal muscle next uh, the neuromuscular junction is made at the junction of the um, muscle and motor neuron glia and motor neuron uh, hippocampal neurons and the osteoblasts or none of the above you can write the answer and then we will discuss so we have seen that the junctions could be of uh, either it could be a uh, junction between a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron or it could be between a uh, uh, between a neuron and a muscle so the neuromuscular junction is uh, made at the junction of um, you can write the answer and we will see so all of you are saying that it should be option a that is muscle and motor neuron so let's see the correct answer so yes it is option a that is uh, the neuromuscular junction is made between the junction of a muscle that is the motor end plate and the and a motor neuron so motor neuron is, or, uh, if you remember the motor neurons originate in the ventral horn of the spinal cord uh, the ventral horn of the spinal cord contain the cell body of the motor neurons and they send their axons to the muscles uh, the skeletal muscles with that they stimulate next moving on to question number 6 uh, bangaru toxin causes paralysis by blocking uh, potassium channels acetylcholine receptor both potassium channels and acetylcholine receptor or none of the above so you can write the answers and we will see which is the correct option So you are saying that it should be the acetylcholine receptor. Let's see. So yes, uh, option B is the right option. That is, the Bangaru toxin causes paralysis by blocking the acetylcholine receptor. So uh, the Bangaru toxin, as it is evident from the name itself, is obtained from the uh, snake whose uh, scientific name is Bangarus. So if you had seen this figure already before, that is uh, the Bangaru toxin could be of several types. The alpha Bangaru toxin, there is then there is the beta Bangaru toxin, and then I also came across this uh, kappa Bangaru toxin. So there are several types. So uh, and each of them are responsible for causing uh, paralysis by blocking the acetylcholine receptor. Uh, so how how does this and at which step does this block the acetylcholine uh, receptor? So here you can see. Uh, alpha BTX, uh, the alpha Bangaru toxin, which blocks the uh, combination of the acetylcholine with its receptors, that is at the postsynaptic level. Uh, and then we, along with that, we have some other uh, uh, toxins obtained from snakes: crow toxin, cobra toxin. Uh, whereas the beta Bangaru toxin uh, is, uh, you can see, it is uh, given here. It stops the release of the acetylcholine receptor uh, from the synaptic vesicle. Uh, or, or from uh, the from the synaptic vesicle. So uh, there are uh, different types of uh, 
toxin variants uh, the bangura toxin variants which could act at different points uh, but since they have only asked here how uh, does this cause paralysis by uh, blocking which channel we can uh, choose the answer as the acetylcholine is active because uh, there are no other options available and since they have haven't provided specifically with any other uh, types so the answer could be answer b that is the uh, it causes paralysis by blocking the acetylcholine receptor channel uh, next moving on to question number 7 so for my tubes cultured on cantilever devices uh, to move the cantilevers which property of cantilevers should be similar to the my tubes uh, the stiffness color uh, weight or fit so you can write the answers and we will see the answer which of them is correct so all of you are saying that it should be option a that is stiffness let's see So yes, uh, option A, stiffness is the right answer. Uh, so for my tubes cultured on cantilever devices to move cantilevers, uh, stiffness is an important property that should be similar to that of the my. So in the joining figure, you can see that this is a our cantilever, and top of which we are drawing our uh, my tubes, and then uh, a force is generated that is which is when then. Uh, detected with the help of a photo detector. So, um, if you remember, uh, we had studied about atomic force microscopy, which is used to study about the uh, topography of a of our surface. Uh, we had studied this in relation to uh, uh, inspecting the uh, topography of the glass or the the surface or the substrate surface on which we uh, grow our cells. So, uh, the this cantilever also works on somewhat same principle that is we grow the my tubes on the surface uh, on of this cantilever device and in response to a uh, contractile force within the my tube or on or upon stimulation the my tubes contract and they uh, which is uh, capable of uh, capable of uh, uh, generating a force which is detected by the by the moving of the cantilever now uh, we have a uh, laser beam which will uh, which which is responsible for uh, sh say shining a light on the surface of this cantilever and and it will be deflected which will be detected by another uh, photo detector so uh, this uh, photo, uh, when the light falls upon this uh, my tube and uh, at it is deflected at a particular angle uh, this will be detected and a particular equation is used to determine the force which is known as the stoney's equation and you will uh, find this information in the uh, articles uh, the link to the articles that i have provided you uh, previously so this is the basic uh, function or uh, the, the basic function of the cantilever and this is the method by which uh, this device works so uh, the stiffness is therefore an important reason uh, or the uh, important property that we must keep in mind and it should be similar to that of the my tube next moving on to question number 8 so question number 8 is uh, the hippocampus is associated with movement color vision learning and memory and vocation so uh, this question um, is uh, not directly related to something that we have studied in this week's lecture it is uh, related to some uh, previous week's lecture however this was a uh, put in this weeks assignment questions in the previous year's session so that is why we are discussing it over here so can we write the answers and we will see i guess you already know the answer it's a very easy question so you're saying there should be option c let's see so yes the hippocampus is associated with a uh, movement uh, color vision Uh, learning and memory in vocation. So uh, option C, learning and memory, is the right answer. So these are the functions of the hippocampus. It is associated with consolidation of new memory, uh, converting short-term memory to long-term memory, emotions, uh, navigation, spatial orientation, and learning. So uh, moving on to question number nine. 
what is a pungent pain producing compound found in plants of the capsicum family uh, it exerts excitatory desensitizing and toxic effects on a subset of sensory neurons including the polymodal nociceptor population uh, capsicin ptx digitoxin or xanthin so you can write the answer and we will see what the correct answer is So the answer is uh, more or less uh, evident from the question itself. So we are talking about a compound which is produced by the uh, plants of the capsicum family. So uh, it is already evident from here uh, what the right answer should be. We are saying that it should be option A, this capsicum. So uh, let's see. Uh, so yes, uh, capsaicin obtained from the capsicum family they exerts the excitatory, desensitizing, toxic effects on a subset of sensory neurons including the polymodal nociceptor population. So uh, the capsaicin is a 8-methyl N-vanillyl 6 none namide, uh, one of the most important natural products that come from chili pepper uh, which is the common name of the fruit of the capsicum plants. Uh, it is the main pungent ingredient in hot chili peppers and elicits a burning pain by activating specific vanilloid receptors on sensory nerve endings. A subgroup of sensory neurons that transmit the sensation of pain known as nociceptors are characterized by their sensitivity to capsaicin uh, which is the active ingredient in hot peppers. Uh, so uh, moving on to our next question. Uh, the last question. Uh, which of the following blocks the sodium ion channel? Uh, TTX, 4AP, calcium or free radicals? So you can write the answer. And we will discuss. Um, so you are saying there should be option A. It is TTX. So uh, let's see. Yes. So TTX or tetrodotoxin blocks the sodium channel. So uh, the tetrodotoxin is a potent marine neurotoxin uh, which is found uh, naturally occurring in some marine organisms such as the puffer fish. It's named as tetrodotoxin as it's most commonly associated with the tetrodon puffer fish. However, the fish itself does not create the toxin. A species of bacteria called pseudo Altero, no, monus tetrodonis, uh, which produces this toxin. The structure of the tetrodotoxin is given here. And uh, TTX poisoning is caused as TTS causes paralysis of the diaphragm, which inhibits one's ability to breathe properly, leading to death. Uh, common symptoms include numbness, sweating, headache, weakness, incoordination, hypertension, and paralysis. It is so poisonous that the amount of TTX can be placed on the tip of a needle and it can kill a full-size adult human. Um, so here you can see how tetrodotox, uh, tetrodotoxin can block the sodium ion channels. And um, it mimics the action of hydrated sodium ions. So the channels would react in the same way it would if a sodi sodium ion were present. Um, as the diagram explains, TT binds to these channels permanently and the size of the compound does not let other sodium ions to pass through the channels and enter the cell. Uh, so, TTX stops sodium ion movement which impairs the central and the peripheral nervous system causing paralysis and eventually death. So, uh, that was all for uh, today's session. Those were the questions. So, um, I would like to thank NPTEL and IIT Madras for giving me this theorship opportunity. Um, I would also like to thank Professor Moina Das, the course instructor for this course for selecting me for this role. Um, I would like to express my gratitude to my supervisor, Professor Mahitosh Mandal, sir. Uh, my, uh, and I would like to thank MHRD, the Government of India, for the Prime Minister's Research Fellowship. Thank IIT Kharagpur for allowing me to pursue PhD at the institution. Uh, lastly, I thank all the participants for joining all the sessions. Um, that's all. Thank you.